Hello, my name is Pamela Bjorkman. I'm from the California Institute of Technology. And today I'll be telling you about two aspects of HIV-1 infection that we study in my lab. And both are somewhat based on structural studies. So the first, we're trying to make reagents that would stop HIV from infecting or would be able to treat an infection uh, that was ongoing. And in the second, we're looking at how what HIV looks like when it's actually in infected tissues. So I'm going to start with the first one. And this one is based upon some thinking we were doing uh, six years ago or so that we published in this opinion piece in 2010. So the title of this was Few and Far Between, How HIV May Be Evading Antibody Avidity. So what we were thinking about, and we meaning Josh Klein and I, Josh was a graduate student at the time, we had noticed that HIV looked fundamentally different than other viruses to which we mount fairly effective immune responses or else we even have vaccines. And so if you just look at pictures of viruses, and these are just examples, there are more in our paper, and you could find more if you look through the literature, what they have in common is a dense array of envelope spikes that allow the virus to get, gain entry into a target cell. And this is actually useful to our immune system because our immune system produces antibodies that are multivalent. So for example, IgG antibodies have two fab arms and they have identical binding sites. So the fact that they have two fab arms means that they can bind with avidity if they're binding to antigens that are tethered to a surface. And so the idea here is that um, this fab is bound to this antigen, and so through the natural off rate process, this fab may fall off, but it's still tethered to the surface here through the fact that it's binding bivalently. Okay, so that's almost certainly why antibodies evolved to have two or more of these arms, is so that they can um, bind with avidity. So if you imagine that if this viral spike mutates and the affinity between the fab and the spike goes down, you may still get the antibody to bind, even though the affinity of the individual fab is reduced, because it has the ability to bind bivalently. So that's what people mean when they say that avidity effects can overcome low affinity. OK, so now look at HIV. It has hardly any spikes on its surface. In fact, it's about the same diameter as flu, about 100 to 150 nanometers. Flu has about 450 envelope spikes. HIV has an average of 14, and these are on average spaced fairly far apart. This is from electron tomography studies of Kenneth Rue, where he mapped out the distribution on different variants of HIV spikes. Reram Subramaniam has done, uh, did similar studies as well. Basically, there aren't very many spikes, and they're fairly far apart. So what happens then when you try to get an IgG to bind to these spikes is it cannot cross-link between adjacent spikes because, for the most part, they're too far away. And I should say that um, the caveat here is that HIV spikes are thought to be relatively immobile, at least on the timescale of antibody binding. So you're not likely to have them freely diffusing so that you could get what we would call inter-spike cross-linking. So what this means, it, we think what this means, is that the combination of HIV's low spike density plus its rapid mutation means that the intrinsic affinity between a fab and the envelope spike will become lower and lower as the envelope spike mutates. And at first, that doesn't matter for the initial antibody response. It binds, it neutralizes. But as the spike mutates enough, you can't overcome the increasingly lowered affinities through inter-spike cross-linking. So we wanted to figure out if we could develop reagents that would overcome this, and then also to see if this idea even made sense in the first place. OK, so could we engineer antibodies that can cross-link between spikes? Well, we can't do that consistently, because even on a single variant, the spikes are distributed different distances from each other. And certainly, by the time you look at a collection of variants, there's just no way to make one reagent that would consistently cross-link between all the spikes here. So what we thought you could do instead is what we call intra-spike cross-linking, so within a single spike. That would mean that you're binding to two adjacent subunits of the spike trimer, and that would allow bivalent binding, which is another word for avidity, despite the low spike density. So it makes no difference that there aren't that many spikes here. All of these reagents would be binding bivalently.
And so if we could do that, then we'd have something to test this hypothesis and maybe it would be a better reagent. So the question is, how can you make these reagents that bind to at least two epitopes within a single spike trimer? So can we do it by modeling based on what's known structurally about the envelope spike uh, structure? Well, there are structures of envelope spikes. Uh, these are from electron tomography and subtomogram averaging from the Subramanium lab. They're done on the surface of virions. There are higher resolution structures done on soluble envelope, but these are on virions. So I want to illustrate the point that on a virion, it's known that, H um, that HIV envelope spikes occupy at least three different conformational states. So there's the closed state that's been seen in higher resolution crystal structures. There's a partially open state they found bound to the B12 antibody. Then there's a open state that's, that's the CD4 released state when it's bound to CD4. And so there's at least these three, there's these three conformational states. We don't know what we're trying to target when we're trying to make these uh, intra-spike cross-linking reagents. So we decided we needed to do some basic measurements. So we decided to use double-stranded DNA as a ruler. The idea would be we would measure distances in a way that I'll explain on the next slide. But the idea is we'd use it as a ruler because up to about 500 angstroms or 150 base pairs, uh, double-stranded DNA is relatively rigid. It behaves almost like a rigid rod. And it has a ruler increment of 3.4 angstroms per base pair. So that allows us to basically use it like this little ruler here. So the idea is, in an experiment, we would compare neutralization potencies of a homodifab. That means we've put the same fab on both sides of a piece of double-stranded DNA. And then we would vary the length of the uh, double-stranded DNA and then measure neutralization potencies. So this is schematically what it looks like if it's the same fab. And these are AFM images of that. And so then we would test neutralization potency in a pseudovirus neutralization assay. And if we imagine that if the linker was too short, only one would bind. If the linker was too long, only one fab would bind. And if it was just right, two would bind. And we would expect to see something in, view, in the way of avidity effects being reflected in increased potency. So this is one example of, of one of these experiments. I'll show you more at, later. But so what we're looking at here is the potency of a CD4 binding site fab. It's from the broadly neutralizing antibody 3BNC60, isolated by Johannes Scheid in Michelle Nussenswag's lab. So it's made into one of these constructs. And then we vary the length of the double-stranded DNA bridge. And then we measure the IC50 in separate in vitro neutralization assays. And these are the potencies of the parent IgG and the fab from 3BNC60. And you can see that you go along for certain lengths, and this would be the too short length. This is then just right, and this is the too long length. So we're really seeing a very intense um, decrease in the IC50, meaning an increase in the potency. And it's over two orders of magnitude over what we started with. So that's very interesting. And if that's against one viral strain. And now if we look at what happens against a collection of viral strains, that's in this coverage curve here. So here we're taking the best uh, homodifab. That's the one with the 62 base pairs linking the 3BNC60s. And we look at this across a panel of uh, primary HIV isolates in this in vitro neutralization assay. And so what you can see is it's better at every sing in every single strain against uh, when compared to the parent IgG. And the interesting thing about this, of course, is that this parent IgG has two fabs. The, the homodifab has two fabs. So they both have two fabs. But this one has the fabs separated by what we think must be the ideal distance to do the intra-spike cross-linking. And this one doesn't. So that's some evidence here. Now, when I, um, so this is published last year in this paper down here. And when we started working on this, I usually get the question of, well, why, why do you have to measure the length? Why don't you just use a flexible linker to join the two fabs? Because that would be a lot easier, and then you wouldn't have to measure anything. And my usual answer to that is, well, yeah, that's what we tried. We tried that for a couple of years, at least four years, and nothing worked. And we started using the rigid linker as, as DNA, and then that began to work. So the question is, do we really need 
a rigid linker between the fabs to get this synergy. So these are new results of Rachel Galamidi, the student who's been working on this. Uh, so here's our original, to address this question. So here's our original construct, the one that worked the best. It's got two 3BNC60 fabs, and it's got a double-stranded DNA linker of 62 base pairs. So now this is, con this is made by, it has a short single-stranded DNA piece here, and another short one here, and then the 62 bases is the double-stranded DNA. And these short single-stranded DNA pieces give it some flexibility once it's attached so that basically it can move with, but this part here is rigid. And that's the one that worked the best. So then she, using the same strategy, she, she made these constructs here. And these are all schematic, so that basically what you're seeing is that this green part represents 62 base pairs, this is 50, this is 40, this is 30, and this is 20. So the region that is rigid now is shorter and shorter, and there's a lot more single-stranded DNA to allow flexibility. But it's always 62 base pairs. Okay, so it's just varying the amount uh, of double-stranded DNA that's in the center of this. And so then, so far, what she's been able to do is test this against two different viral strains. And in each case, what you can see is this is um, the potency of the neutralization assay curve. This is for the 62 base pair, the original homodifab. And these are, in this collection here, are all the different flexibly linked ones with still 62 bases, but not 62 bases of double-stranded DNA. And so they're all about as good as each other, and they're just nowhere near as good as the homodifab with the rigid linker. So here's, for reference, is the parent IgG. So these are about as good as the parent IgG. So they're probably binding monovalently, and then they're, they're all better than the fab in both cases here. OK, so that means that we think we need a double-stranded DNA linker. So I want to go ahead and describe some other reagents we're making and what we hope to make in the future. But first, I want to show you that we can also make what we call heterodifabs. So here's the coverage curve for what I showed you before. That's the 3BNC60 homodifab. Now we've linked 3BNC60 to um, a, we've linked it now to a, uh, to another to an antibody against another epitope. So this is PG16. It binds to the apex of the trimer. And then it's linked to uh, 3BNC60 right here so that it can bind to two different epitopes on the trimer. So we call this a heterodifab. So the, now this is a coverage curve against um, and strains, at least uh, 25, I think, strains of viruses. And uh, what you can see is it's really orders, it's two orders of magnitude on average more potent than the parents, either 3BNC60 or PG16. So this is a tremendous increase in potency. And the reason this is very interesting is in part because both of these antibodies are close relatives of them, are in clinical trials in humans. 3BNC117 from Michelle Nussenswag's lab is almost the same thing as 3BNC60. And that is in clinical trials as a protein in humans with some promising results. And PG9, a close relative of PG16, is in clinical trials using an AAV vector by Phil Johnson. So these antibodies could be improved. If we could make something like this that in practical purposes could go into humans, we're not suggesting you inject something that has DNA on it. But if we could make something that mimicked this with a rigid protein linker, this is how much better we could do. OK, so why? another reason we're very interested in this is not just increases in potency. But we're really interested in the idea that avidity could suppress viral escapes that not, of course, you can't stop the virus from mutating. But you can stop it, hopefully, from mutating in an effective way. So what Rachel did was to set up um, in vitro evolution experiments where you grow, you start with cells, and you infect them with a virus, and then you allow them to grow in the presence of an antibody or a mixture of antibodies. And then you look for viral escapes as a function of time while you do this type of experiment. And then you sequence, uh, you can sequence the viruses that we'll, we'll do that later. But for, for the time being, what we're doing is we're looking at the percent of infected cells as a function of time. And so you can see that when you add 3BNC60, originally it reduces the number of infected cells by a lot. But then it just goes up when you have the inevitable escape viruses. PG16, the same thing happens, reduces it, goes up, 
And then when you mix the two, it goes down and it goes up again and maybe not to as high of a level. So the mixture is somewhat better than the individual antibodies, but it still allows quite a bit of viral escape. And now in these preliminary data, we need to extend the experiment for longer days, for a longer number of days. But we're, we were very encouraged to see that it appears that we're getting at least a hint of suppression of effective viral escapes. So obviously the viruses are still mutating, but they're not able to go on and infect cells in the same way that any of these are. So this suggests then that having this heterodifab that binds, we think, to the same spike with avidity is in fact um, allowing us to suppress these viral escapes. And that's what we'd really like to be able to do is stop HIV from mutating effectively. Okay, so then I just want to say something about one of the things we're trying to do to learn about what envelope confirmations there are on, on viruses using these molecular, this double-stranded DNA as a molecular ruler. So remember I said there were at least three different confirmations on viral envelopes. There's more than that, and we know this because um, we've been studying structures of viral envelopes, and this is a crystal structure that Louisa Scharf in the lab solved uh, it's published uh, in September of 2015. This is a BG505 SOSIP, and it's, it's in the closed state. So this is similar to the structures of um, BG505 SOSIPs from Scripps Labs and also from the VRC. Okay, so that's a closed structure, and it's bound to one of um, Johannes Scheid and Michelle Nussenswag's antibodies called ADNC195. Well, in that same paper, we reported a lower resolution single particle EM structure of the same antibody bound to a BG505 SOSIP, but we added CD4 to open the SOSIP into this open state. And then that wasn't a very stable complex, so we added 17B, which is a CD4I antibody, to bind to the top. And we got something that was quite stable and suitable for single particle EM studies. And the confirmation was something that's never been seen before. So it's not fully open. It's certainly not shut. It's not the previously reported partially open structure. It's kind of midway between those. So that's, that's structure number four for the envelope. And there's got to be more than that. So I think we're just at the beginning of seeing what this envelope can do. But the point is, I think we need, it would be really interesting to use these reagents as rulers. So, so we repeat this experiment that I described on one of the earlier slides. We basically just compare neutralization potency as a function of the linker length of double-stranded DNA, and then you know too short, too long, just right. So I already showed you this example here where you plot IC50 versus the linker length. And I just wanted to show you that's for 3BMC60 against this viral strain here, 6535. When we, also, when we tested against DU172, we see a similar curve, not as dramatic though, but this one also has the best potency at about 60 to 62 base pairs. And then we did it again with another CD4 binding site antibody that's related to 3BNC60, uh, the parent class. This is VRC01, the parent uh, of the VRC01 class of antibodies of which 3BNC60 is one. Okay, so all of these have a minimum near 60 base pairs. If you do the math here, that's around 210 angstroms. And so then we look on what we know structurally about the closed state, uh, closed state or the open state. And so which is this? Well, if we measure between the C termini of the fabs, which is where the double-stranded DNA is covalently linked, 210 angstroms corresponds to this structure here, which is a CD4 bound open structure. That's not what we were expecting. We were expecting that it would be neutralizing and binding best to the closed structure. So this may mean that during neutralization by a bivalent reagent, which I would submit to you that has never been seen before because I think most antibodies bind with one fab, if you bind bivalently to the same spike, it may force the structure open. In any case, that's the result we see. We did this again for B12 homodifabs. B12 is another CD4 binding site antibody. And we saw one of the distances here, it's more complicated, but it corresponded to this structure here that had been from the Subramanium lab, which was the B12 partially open state. Okay, so to summarize this part of the talk, we've been, 
This measuring method, we think, reveals interesting dynamic information about the conformations of the envelope during neutralization. So what we're going ahead to do is to compare optimal distances for tier 1 versus tier 2 viruses to see if they differ. Um, CD4 dependent versus CD4 independent strains, and maybe the envelopes are in, are in systematically different states among these different classes of, of viruses. And as I showed you in the coverage curves, we achieved up to 100-fold increases in geometric mean potency with the first generation. This is just the first generation of these intraspike cross-linking reagents. And this supports the hypothesis that the low spike density of HIV contributes to the vulnerability of anti-HIV antibodies to mutation. And we think clearly HIV evolved purposely to do this. Um, we think that the ideal anti-HIV therapeutics for passive delivery would utilize avidity to achieve intraspike cross-linking. And of course, we're trying to make these using protein-based rigid linkers, not DNA-based linkers. This would reduce the concentration required for sterilizing immunity. It would take this HIV's evolved capacity for this low spike density. It would make it irrelevant, and then it would hopefully uh, these reagents would be resistant to effective envelope mutations, which is suggested by our preliminary in vitro results. And so then another way that this might work well is analogous to using several drugs or several antibodies during an antiretroviral therapy, if you get simultaneous binding to different epitopes, you would also either abrogate or, or, or reduce the sensitivity to envelope mutations. OK, so this is a segue to a short talk on other things we're doing in my lab. Um, I wanted to say that when I've talked about this before, often people say, well, you know, you're studying viruses in vitro, and they might have a low spike number. Um, but in an infection, they've got to have more spikes than that, or they couldn't survive, and they couldn't infect cells. And so they must have more spikes than that. And so we, we looked. So we've been doing electron tomography of infected tissues. These are from HIV-infected humanized mice. And then we can, as I'll show you later, we can identify HIV variants. And so we have a panel. This is EM work done by Mark Ladinsky. We have a panel of hundreds of these variants. I'll show you a number of them, identified in an infection. And this is from a tissue sample with all the relevant cell types. And if you look at all these HIVs, uh, there's the preservation in these plastic embedded stained samples is not as good as you'd have in cryo-EM, so we can't actually localize the spikes, but you don't see them here. And in galleries of hundreds of these, we basically see very few. This is MLV, murine leukemia virus, another retrovirus. It has a normal distribution of spikes and a normal number, and you can see them here. This is a collaboration we've been doing uh, with Walter Motes at Yale, which I'll talk about a bit more in reference to the HIV work. OK, so that, those studies were done by electron tomography. So I just want to introduce you to this or remind you of this. Um, electron tomography is a way to get a three-dimensional structure of an asymmetric or a, a non-identical object. So if you have a virus and it's not the same as other viruses, or you have cells or tissues, you take a series of tilts. By tilting the stage of the microscope, you get 2D projections that you can make into a 3D object. And that's how these uh, images were obtained here from these papers right here. OK, so I'd like to point out that this type of three-dimensional EM has been very important for understanding HIV biology. It's been used to study purified variants. I've been showing you this picture all along. Uh, it's been used to get subtomogram average structures of the spikes. This is cryo-EM, so they could actually visualize the spikes pretty well. And then it's also been done on cells. So virally infected cultural ce cultured cells have been looked at by electron tomography to look at what might be virological synapses and buds and so on. But these are cultured cells, or they're just purified variants. And of course, HIV infection occurs in an organism, many different cell types. Those are organized into tissues. There's morphological changes during an HIV infection in those tissues. You can, just cannot reproduce this in cultured cells. So the reason this is why we want to do electron tomography of HIV-infected tissue samples now. OK, so 
we've been looking at uh, longitudinal imaging, that is, as a function of time after infection in HIV-infected humanized mice. We've been doing it in parallel with immunofluorescence and also electron microscopy. And this is an example of a large amount of tissue stained for immunofluorescence. It's, this is taken out of the humanized mouse, and then in parallel we do samples for EM. And uh, the, this work was presented at the Keystone meeting by Colin Kiefer, who's shown right here. Okay, so our first study on electron tomography of infected tissues was published two years ago in PLOS Pathogens, and we were using BLT mice, which were provided to us, which are humanized mice that were provided to us by Doug Kwan and Andrew Tagger at the Reagan, Reagan Institute. We imaged the gut, which is an early site for HIV replication and T cell depletion. And what this allowed us to do was a quantitative analysis of the numbers and types of infected cells to look at where the viruses are in the tissues. Uh, are they inside the cell? Are they outside the cell? Are they budding or are they free? Are they mature versus immature? And then to look at whether or not um, viruses were going into other cells through cell-to-cell -cell spread versus infection by a free virus. So first, I need to convince you what's published in the uh, Ladinsky et al. paper two years ago is that we can distinguish by zooming in on the electron tomograms uh, immature from mature variants, and we know these are HIV. So this is an immature variant, uh, and this is a mature variant. These are stained with what's called positive stain, and the difference is there's a circular capsid here, and then it collapses into this bullet-shaped core that's familiar to HIV researchers. And this is what it looks like um, under negative stain. So you see the uh, circular um, structures here, and then in the mature thing, you can see the cone right here. And these are such high quality of preservation that you can see the RNA in the middle, and you can see different layers of the HIV capsid. Okay, and then we, to prove these really were HIV, we labeled them with, um, here's anti, this is immuno-EM, this is anti-P24, and this is an antibody against the envelope. So these are HIV, and, and Mark Ladinsky can find these in the HIV-infected humanized mice. So this is a movie that shows you what we do. We take the mouse with a human immune system. We, in this case, we took out the gut. We looked at them by EM. And so now you're seeing color-enhanced viruses in this region between a couple of cells. And uh, there's a bud of a HIV coming out. I'll show you more of the buds. This is a narrow channel that was actually between two cells. And at first, we thought it was inside the cell. But because this is in three dimensions, you can look in other parts of the tomogram that aren't shown here, but we could see that this actually connected to the extracellular space. So this was something that was reaching inside the cell, but uh, morphologically, this is extracellular. It's not, it's not like an endocytosis event. Okay, so this was um, quite interesting, the things we could do with this. And so what I'm gonna give you is just one example of what we've been trying to do is to address the question of how much of a natural infection occurs by cell-to-cell -cell spread versus free virus infection. So I'm gonna digress for a moment to what happens in murine leukemia virus infection. And this is known to occur through virological synapses. And this is described in a really nice paper by Walter Motes and colleagues that was published last year in Science. So basically, this is the murine leukemia virus. This is a retrovirus, it comes in it binds to macrophages, but it doesn't infect them. The macrophages hands those off to B1 cells, and then the, B1, the infected B1 cell synapses with an uninfected cell, and there's a virological synapse here. So Mark Ladinsky was able to take um, Walter, uh, Walter's samples here from the MLV-infected mice and look at them by electron tomography, and this is, um, this is part of this paper here, this is the part that uh, Mark Ladinsky in my lab did. So this is an electron tomogram, a reconstruction now of a donor cell and a target cell. And we know this is infected because if you zoomed in, you can see buds. And then it's going to pass it off to this target cell. It forms this enormous uropod-like uropod structure that have been described on lymphocytes before. And these red dots here are the MLVs that are getting handed off. The color coding here is that green is the donor cell. The other colors are different membranous protrusions, and then pink is the target cell here. So the point is we can see virological synapses in another 
system. We don't really see them very much at all in the HIV-infected humanized mouse. We can find regions of contact between infected and uninfected cells. So here's one example here. And they actually label with uh, virological synapse membrane markers. This is ICAM-1. This is LFA-1. And this is an example here that I'm going to show you the tomogram for. So you'll see in 3D if the movie, yeah, the movie's running. So you'll see that um, what's going to come up is there's that bud that's interacting across what we think is probably this synapse. But the amazing thing is the reason you need the 3D reconstruction is the outline of this cell here is this complicated green border here. These are other variants here that are marked by dots. So this is like an intercellular space between two cells. That's not, that doesn't look like the MLV virological synapse. Now we can also find instances where we have pools of virions. In this case, there were over 300 particles. Mark could tell that they were mature because they had the collapsed cone. And we found them in the intercellular space between two HIV-infected cells. We know they're both infected because they had, a, they had buds coming out from them. So they have to be infectable cells. In other words, they can't be mouse cells that are obviously in the mouse because it's not fully reconstituted with human cells. But these are HIV-infectable cells. We don't see a virological synapse here. Um, so this is a summary of this. Both of these cells are, have buds coming out, so they're infectable. And they have a lot of free variants. And what this suggests that at least some transmission of free virus occurs during a quote unquote natural infection. And we have to put a caveat here because this is an HIV infected humanized mouse. OK, so we'd like to continue this in a more physiologically relevant sample, for example, SIV-infected macaque samples or SHIV-infected macaque samples. So uh, we'd be very happy to talk to um, more biologically oriented people on what sorts of questions to address next. And of course, we're always interested in samples for this. So I'd like to then thank the people who did the work. Uh, the interspike crosslinking project was done almost entirely by Rachel Galamidi, a graduate student who's now just recently uh, defended her thesis and is now a PhD. Anthony West did a lot of the work, initial early work and thinking about this. And Josh Klein started the whole avidity hypothesis idea in my lab. These are a number of people who've helped, including Michael Seaman, who did neutralization assays uh, for us at the CAVD facility. And then the other part I talked about was the electron tomography and immunofluorescence of HIV-infected tissues. Colin Kiefer, a postdoc, and Mark Ladinsky, a staff EM scientist, with samples from people at the Reagan Institute. So thank you very much for your attention.